tonight's speaker, I'm very pleased to have Radek joining us. Um, I met him through Kanban University um, and we had the pleasure of doing some work together when he came and supported me um, with some trainers on the Kanban Trainer Trainer program. Uh, so, you know, it's been great to get to know him. But he's an absolute expert in absolutely everything in Kanban, but he's going to be talking to us about uh, cognitive biases tonight, which I'm sure there's, there's a few things in Kanban as well. So uh, without further ado, Eric, I'm going to hand over to you. I've built you up now. Don't let me down. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to do my best. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or good evening or wherever you are. Um, good, good um, time of your day. Um, thanks for the invitation, Helen. And indeed, uh, today I would like to focus us, uh, I mean, mostly people involved somehow into Kanban as coaches or trainers or um, maybe people who see themselves as ch change agents in all type of, you know, agility or, or different frameworks or, or methods. Um, because, of course, I'll give you a few examples how I see cognitive biases, um, I would say, useful and, of course, dangerous for adoption or implementation of certain uh, Kanban tools or techniques. Um, but uh, we are going to talk about it in, in a very wide, I would say, um, uh, range. Um, so, of course, uh, you, you can probably translate uh, the examples that I'm going to um, give or discuss uh, to, to any other um, area of, uh, yeah, probably change, change management, uh, the way we try to influence or, uh, well, that's a dangerous word, even manipulate people. So, um, yeah, uh, looking at the chat, uh, I have one interactive exercise in the very beginning. I'll introduce you to it in a moment. Uh, but I'm also open to all type of questions or, um, yeah, uh, if, 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 you, if you have any questions, if you strongly disagree with anything that I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, feel free to raise your hand, uh, unmute yourself, ask a question, or if you uh, prefer, uh, write it, uh, we'll try to, um, to, to also um, answer them or address them either in the between or, or address them uh, by the end for sure. Um, Okay, I didn't say anything about myself. So I'm based in Wrocław in Poland. Uh, I, I stepped into Kanban world, uh, oh gosh, over 10 years ago. Uh, and I still uh, succeed, but I still also uh, make terrible mistakes. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, why is it like this? Uh, am I just stupid? Uh, am I running in circles? Uh, is it me? Is it people? W what is wrong with it? And uh, of course, some years ago, uh, like many people in our, I would say, industry or a bubble, I, I of course, stepped into the topic of, uh, you know, behavioral economics and, and psychology and, and uh, um, I would say some reasoning why people very often act so irrational uh, in their professional lives or, or private lives. And uh, I wanted to, to look at it uh, today from a perspective uh, of a Kanban coach or someone who introduces the changes or needs to face uh, with the teams um, and individuals in organizations, um, basically uh, trying to yeah uh, implement, I would say, uh, new, uh, new new things. Um, so maybe uh, a few words about uh, you know managing expectations. What I'm gonna talk about, what I'm not gonna talk about. Probably I won't give you any silver bullets. Sorry, sorry to say it. So if you expect like a solution which is gonna be always work in every context, in every team, that's not probably what you're going to uh, uh, find here. Uh, there are over 150 um, cognitive biases uh, which were mapped or identified, named, uh, codified. We're not going to talk about all of them for sure. We, we're going to just talk about a few that I find interesting uh, from my personal perspective. Um, and uh, there are going to be some controversial topics included. Uh, because we're going to talk about the global, global climate change. Oh, gosh. We're going to talk about Instagram influencers and vaccination programs. That's even worse. And we're going to talk about story points. So all types of controversial topics in our industry are going to be discussed here. Yeah? So, so be, be, be ready for it. Um, so if you are not discouraged by it, uh, not scared away by the fact that I'm going to talk about such topics, then uh, please, uh, please stay with me. Um, so, so first of all, we're going to talk about uh, cognitive biases, and I have an exercise for you um, 
So um, let me share a link uh, to a mural board. Uh, you probably are familiar with a tool like this. Uh, so those of you who are in front of computers and, and have some time, uh, maybe uh, just uh, let's let's just um, I, I'll give you a minute. Uh, click the link, enter the mural board, and and please uh, try to put here on the board any name of the cognitive bias that, that you know. If you don't know the the professional psychological name, that's also fine. You can just you know double click and and write a post it with uh, um, with maybe a short description. Yeah. So like if you don't know what's its name, but you know how people irrationally or strange behave because of this cognitive bias, then just please uh, type it here. And uh, I'm going to set, uh, I'm going to first of all, set the private mode so we don't see what you're writing. And uh, second of all, I'm going to give you a timer, uh, maybe just two minutes max. Um, let's see how many, how many post-its are going to show up. So I'm going to delete mine and I'll wait for your input. Um, so if you... If you are attracted to this uh, meetup today because you know, you heard, uh, maybe you identify any cognitive bias in your behavior or behavior of your, your clients, your teams, uh, just please write it, uh, uh, write it there. We're going to expose it in a moment. Okay, a few seconds to go. If you if you are still writing anything, that's fine. Thank you, Helen, for uh, repeating the link. Indeed, if, if someone just joined, uh, they probably haven't seen the uh, the link to the mural board. Okay, time's up. So let's um, let's uh, finish or let's end the private mode. Let's see confirmation bias. Oh my, so many times. You see, that's. Uh, um, that's what uh, many people uh, remember uh, from cognitive biases. That's good because we are not going to talk about it today. That's, <laughs> that's good. Um, one more <laughs> confirmation bias, uh, bias of behaving control. Yeah, there's, there's something like this. Halo effect. Yeah, confirmation bias one more time. Uh, looking for data that support uh, an existing point of view. Yeah, very good. Uh, logical fallacy, confirmation bias, uh, Dunning-Kruger effect, uh, assistive. I don't even know what's that, but there's so many of them. Okay, there's uh, there's one more thing. Assuming attractive people are funnier, smarter. Oh yeah, we we gonna talk uh, about it uh, in in a few um, few aspects. Uh, am I missing anything? No, I think that's it. Thank you very much. So um, it seems that you uh, you know examples of cognitive biases. That's that's very good because that means that, that you're not probably totally new to the topic. Um, but uh, why did I ask you about it uh, now? Because well, um, I could say let's talk about cognitive biases and start and uh, continue and talk to you about certain things. And I could uh, simply assume that you know. And that would be probably the first uh, first cognitive bias that I would step uh, uh, into as a, as a trainer or as a coach. What kind of cognitive bias am I talking about? Of course, curse of knowledge. So curse of knowledge is that we think, we believe, we project that the world around us, people around us know what we know. Yeah? So if I'm a Kanban guy, 
then probably I'm going to start talking to you and you all know what your what Kanban is. Yeah. And I cannot imagine that you don't know what I'm talking about. And of course, uh, this is basically applicable to everything, everything in our professional or personal lives. Yeah. Um, so how can we uh, how can we uh, get I would say get rid of the trap of of uh, of such uh, thing? So well, before we go to Kanban examples, let's talk about the cognitive biases, what they are. Um, many of you are probably introduced to the topics by the books of great authors. I'm going to refer to many books uh, tonight. Uh, many people uh, probably read or listened uh, the audiobook of Daniel Kahneman, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. That's a huge book uh, full of uh, really great, uh, great insights. Um, and uh, well, even in Kanban classes, whoever were in the Kanban uh, system improvements class know that we even refer to, uh, to Daniel Kahneman's work, right? Saying that our brains uh, operate with the system one and system two. We have these heuristics. Uh, we, we have this, uh, you know, logical shortcuts, if you, if you prefer also the biases, um, which uh, support the system one. Uh, like generalizations or, um, or or seeing some some patterns where sometimes they do not really exist. Uh, the other great author, if you're if you want to go deeper into um, the cognitive biases, is probably uh, yeah um, Daniel uh, Dan Ariely here, uh, who also uh, in a very funny way uh, proves that we are very irrational. Um, I strongly recommend this book because since I read it and I said that I'm very often in this, you know, decision paralysis, I took seriously his advice that every time I'm in a restaurant and I don't know what to order or every time I'm in a kind of, you know, a decision crunch, which, which type of you, new electronic gadget to choose or which type of, of, you know, plan to choose from an operator, I always take the second most expensive, yeah, because that's the best choice. So <laughs> I don't have... I don't have the you know um, bad feeling that I spent uh, a lot of money on the most expensive one. But if I second, if I choose the second most expensive, that's probably a good choice. Yeah, uh, um, that's uh, that's of course a, a simple example. But uh, yeah, if we look into into Wikipedia, we're going to find that the cognitive biases are first of all system systematic pattern deviation from some kind of norm, so from some kind of uh, rational judgment. Um, and it's not like, I'm sorry for the words, the people are dumb, the people are stupid. No, it's just like they interpret the reality, they interpret the, fa the facts, the, the, same, uh, see, the same things that we see, and, and they create their own subjective reality. Um, and uh, we see, unfortunately, this in our modern world when we are like very much, I would say, uh, polarized in our views. That's why I said, like, you know, politics and, and uh, climate change and, and uh, I don't know, public health care and, and stuff like that are, are also, of course, the topics where we uh, take some shortcuts, where we build some positions, we, we build some point of views. They are not always uh, rational. Um, but uh, I entitled this, this speech, like, are the cognitive biases friends or foes? Because it's not like they are only bad things uh, happening to us. Uh, they make our lives uh, easier to a certain degree. And uh, I imagine, I know, because I see some familiar faces even here that some of you are uh, true change agents, some people who take organizations and teams and people through, through the changes, uh, maybe there is uh, also some set, some examples of uh, cognitive uh, biases, which we could use in our favor to, to, to make it into our uh, advantage. So um, let's take an example from the Kanban world. Um, we, we say that, okay, uh, lots of people here are probably describing themselves as agile coaches or scrum masters, or maybe precisely Kanban people. Um, and the curse of knowledge, uh, re referring to the first uh, cognitive bias, is that we imagine that, come on, it's 2022. Probably everyone knows the newest definition of Scrum Guide. Everyone knows what is hidden in the Kanban method. Everyone knows what is Agile. Everyone knows what is uh, Scrum. Everyone knows what is a lead time histogram, isn't it? Yeah. Well, that's our assumption, and that's the curse that if we know such things, uh, then we, we project on people that they also know. It. Um, when we start uh, through Kanban, so we want to move from Kanban board to Kanban system, what we do is we say, well, let's limit work in progress. 
what happens when we say a thing like this is that many people basically run away. Oh my God, I'm not going to have anything to do. Oh my God, I'm going to be slacking. I'm not going to have a ticket to report my time on, etc. Yeah, because they imagine different things be, be behind uh, what we mean by uh, limiting work in progress. Now, what is what is now a kind of hint for all the coaches or or change agents is like whenever we see a situation like this, I'm going to refer to again amazing job by by Judy Rees, another British author who is known for the clean language is that every time we say we would like to do X, we should come with the question, what kind of X? And the same basically applies to, okay, you want to limit work in progress, what kind of work in progress uh, limit are we talking about? And what is the, the work in progress limit that you heard about, that you imagine in your head? I'm gonna share a few examples that I, uh, yeah, I said I failed many times, I keep failing because I am also, uh, you know, aware that knowing about cognitive biases is not protecting us from uh, being influenced by the cognitive biases. Um, but uh, one of the examples was that I was once speaking to a manager who said, well, if you're going to introduce the work in progress limit, I know what's going to happen. And what's going to happen is like we're going to introduce the WIP limit per person and everyone is going to be have, uh, happy because they are not going to be personally overloaded. Uh, but it may end up in a situation that the things won't flow through my board. Yeah? Whoever tried to introduce the, uh, the, the, the work in progress limits, whoever have seen any kind of, you know, low maturity or as we call it in the past, uh, proto Kanban board, we know that it happens. Yeah? People may start with uh, personal uh, whip limits and unfortunately they will end up with it and, and, and things don't go as we, as we have imagined. Now, I also have seen examples where business people approaching me and saying like, Radek, that's not so great as you, uh, as you say, or as we thought it's going to be, uh, because we limited our work in progress to columns, right? And we say, well, the team is now having some kind of balanced work between the demand uh, for the work and the ca their capability to deliver it. Um, but if we look at this board, we see it's very colorful. So we see blue cards and green cards and yellow cards and some red cards. The problem is that we as business wait for the big blue things to be uh, happened uh, or delivered or the big, the, the big green epic to be finished. And we don't see it coming out because people are working on the pieces of it. Of course, uh, working on, on the pieces of the bigger uh, portion of, of work is, is, is necessary because that's what we could say determine the delivering the big big part of it, but uh, we don't want this work in progress limit because look what it did to our system. Everyone is happy. Uh, some work is uh, basically leaving the system, but it's not what we expect that that's going to happen. Um, and of course, we could say, well, maybe the types of whip limits that you heard about, type of whip limits that you imagine that they're going to hurt you, it's, it's not what, what I meant, because yes, you probably uh, uh, expo you were exposed to some examples like the whip limits per person or whip limits per column, but we also want to talk about the focus for the whole team or the, for the stream of work, and we want to introduce some kind of epic level whip limit when we say, yeah, I mean, if you're completely um, missing work items, you may take some bugs to fix or something like this. But our overall goal is to limit or to focus, if, if you prefer, on the big thing, um, which is a blue epic or green epic. And we want to finish it first before we start working on the yellow one. Well, these are just a few examples of, of many misunderstandings uh, because I said whip limit and they heard whip limit and they imagined the whip limit in a very different way than, than I imagined, right? And it's, it's, it's nobody's fault. It's just like uh, every time we heard, uh, you know, let's do X or let's do Y. Um, as coaches, we, I would say, should first uh, ask what kind of X? What do you understand as X? Because uh, this is uh, something that, well, maybe for experienced coaches is, is absolutely um, obvious. But uh, come on, we, uh, we very often uh, in, in hurry, we very often take mental shortcuts and, and uh, we don't ask um, what, is, uh, what is in people's uh, mind. Okay, so um, question is, 
do do I think the cognitive biases are only the uh, the examples like like with this um, curse of knowledge that you know we should better we should be very aware if we're not going to take any mistakes any shortcuts um, could they be something more well uh, I will try to um, convince you let's say uh, that. Uh, like I already said, knowing about biases doesn't protect us from being influenced by them, uh, but knowing uh, how the same biases um, influence other people's uh, behavior uh, may uh, work, I would say, in, in our favor. Um, and now I said I'm going to use, uh, well, maybe a controversial word to manipulate. That's why I changed it to influence because not all coaches agree that you know manipulation is a is a good word or a good technique. Um, but if you if you look into the books like uh, like nudge from uh, Richard Taylor and and Cass Sunstein uh, or uh, well pretty well known for decades already um, influenced by um, Robert Cialdini, uh, you all know that well. Come on, every type of leadership, every kind of uh, um, being a change agent is to a certain degree, uh, you know, nudging people, so convincing them to do, maybe influencing a little bit the way they uh, they will act. And we say, well, people are irrational. Uh, we should we shouldn't say people. We should say we are irrational because we are no no one. <laughs> we are the same people that we are talking about uh, talking about our um, our psychology. Um, and we know that uh, people are very irrational uh, in their decisions. So, like, I don't know if ever if if any of you were um, ever wa waiting for a bus, uh, and you see that the bus is late, and maybe the traffic is not uh, looking normally. So maybe there's some jam, traffic jam, or some accident, and you're not. We that we don't know if this bus is is coming. Um, but we feel like, come on, we've invested so much time waiting for this bus that it would be now um, a waste. It would be a, a risky decision to go away. Well, um, if we look at the sunk cost fallacy, um, cognitive bias, we know that that's not probably the best uh, way to spend our time. Uh, because maybe that would be much better to start walking. Maybe that would be maybe even healthier for us. Uh, but it would it could be also a better option to I don't know call for a taxi or an Uber drive or, or something like this. Um, in in professional life, we also see it every time we enter uh, a, a team and we see the board and we see that hey there is a ticket. Uh, definitely, this ticket is very old. It's been already started there months ago. Um, it's uh, it's it's already. Um, I don't know, weeks, uh, talking about the WIP age, so work in progress age. And we very often ask teams like, okay, why don't we drop it? No, 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 that's that's almost done, right? So we have two types of uh, cognitive biases here. One is like sunk cost fallacy. We feel like we, we invested so much time already into it. Um, and of course, uh, we have the second uh, type of um, uh, irrationality, uh, that we we feel either personal, even or emotional attachment to this ticket, so we don't want to remove this ticket, yeah, because it's it's ours, it's it's there, we 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 committed to it, so uh, so well, that's that's not really convenient for us to um, to get rid of it. Yeah? So we have, I would say, a kind of overlap of two cognitive biases. Um, the same happens to, uh, I, I would say, everyone who tries to support people in position of product managers or product owners. Because we know that uh, by default, many organizations have their product backlogs. These product backlogs are lengthy lists of, uh, you know, uh, multiple, multiple items. What product managers or product owners do is like they shuffle, they, they, they juggle with these items, moving them up and down and up and down again. Um, and uh, it doesn't make it easy to uh, easier to understand how old they are. Mm, maybe we could look at it, uh, but our Kanbanish, let's just say, way of, of uh, exposing some um, uh, some bad behaviors here is, uh, well, um, I would say distributing these tickets from one dimensional list to something what we call upstream Kanban. So I, I on purpose draw it as a kind of funnel. Um, so we have this regular board on the right, and then we have the upstream funnel on the left. Um, and uh, let's try to distribute these tickets. And once we do it, uh, it, it looks fresh and nice. Uh, but I don't know if I'm the only one in many organizations that we uh, agreed and we even have a buy-in to do such step. 
Um, I come to these organizations uh, later, and what I find is that we have these tickets not moving at all for days and tens of days and months and so on. Um, and uh, very often I ask a question like, okay, what is what is the maximum time that the tickets can spend there? Uh, and, and I try to, uh, you know, shoot from like a very high level. Like, is it is it okay to, to have it for 200 days? Like, no, come on, right? 200 days, that's too much. Uh, probably someone from the management would notice and they would escalate, etc. So I'm asking, is 50 days acceptable? Well, we have examples of 50, 60 days, so maybe that is acceptable. Uh, do you think it should be not more than 10? Well, we wish we would there, but well, we know we, we have all this work, all this work is important, all this work is already invested into, and, and we can't uh, get rid of it. Um, if we start talking to these people about, okay, how about we do X and X is like remove something of it, uh, we will definitely hear a, a story that, oh no, it, it, it cannot happen. It's going to be a, a really bad thing. Um, someone is, is going to have a sleepless night because of that. And I would say what helps in here is not a cognitive bias, but it's a very good, I would say, psychological technique which is called decatastrophizing. Yeah? So like, okay, let's talk about the worst possible thing that's going to happen if we remove this item from the backlog or we remove it from the upstream. Yeah? Okay, so no one will notice. Okay, that's a happy scenario. Someone will notice. Okay, they will come and they will have complaints. Okay, then we'll know that it's for sure needed. Yeah? It's, uh, it's not easy, I would say, but, uh, but asking such inconvenient questions can, can actually help in here. Um, I, I haven't seen in the examples of the biases that you listed, and, and I bet you heard about it, uh, but we are gonna, uh, we're going to talk about uh, it, it, this thing. It's a, it's a piece of furniture, uh, comes from Sweden, but I guess uh, it's, it's uh, worldwide available, right? Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, another cognitive bias, which is called IKEA effect. What is IKEA effect? Maybe you heard about it. We basically, um, I would say, uh, value more things that we have done by ourselves than things which are uh, basically purchased, for example, ready. Yeah. So why is it the care effect? Because like if you if you buy a, a ready piece of furniture and they bring it to you uh, in one piece, um, you may even spend more money on it than on a cheap uh, furniture from IKEA. Um, but if you invest your time and your effort and maybe make a mistake and redo the assembly work for the for the Malm cupboard or the Malm um, drawer, then uh, then of course, uh, when you want to get rid of it and you want to sell it on the you know second hand market, you you cannot you cannot accept the fact that people don't value it so much. Like they they want to pay you like a very little money for it. Well, come on, this is not any type of Malm uh, desk. It's a Malm desk that you have been. And what can we learn from it? Well, I would say if you're a coach, if, if you're a change agent, it is important to understand that, yes, you can do it with the team. Uh, you can help them with a hammer, like the small uh, small person uh, drawn in here, but you shouldn't uh, do it for the team and you definitely shouldn't do it without the team. So we know that the, the worst examples ever is that, you know, if you send anyone from the team to a Kanban, Scrum or whatever class, and they will come next morning and next week and they say, you know what, over the weekend, I designed the board for you. I, I designed a perfect Kanban system for us. Okay, it happens. Uh, we know. How could we, how, how could we prevent it from happening? How could we uh, prevent from, from, you know, making the work for the team? Well, in the Kanban toolkit, there is a thing which, which is called static, yeah? system thinking approach to introducing Kanban. How should we do it? Well, uh, those of you who have KS, KSD class um, behind you, and I guess many people do, we know that um, it's, it's, a, it's a chain. Uh, it, it, it doesn't need to be even one, uh, one iteration of going through these points, but we say we want to talk about reasons for, satis for dissatisfaction. We want to talk about the, uh, the sources and, and characteristics of the demand coming to your team. We want to talk about uh, your delivery capability. We want to build all together the, uh, the workflow model, which may be the same or may be different for different uh, uh, classes of service or, or different uh, work items that you deliver or different pieces of value. And in the very end, you have the 
could say a prototype uh, or, or a proto Kanban uh, design system. And if you do it the right way, if you do it with the team, uh, if you engage people into it, uh, they will feel that it's it's their board. Yeah? And if it's their board, it's, uh, it's, it's gonna be, I would say connect, we, we could connect it even to this loss aversion because if it's gonna be their board, they won't let it go so, so easily. We also have uh, here this uh, um, green uh, hashtag uh, written, uh, maybe that's not the best font uh, uh, written by me, but it says invented here. So we have two type of cognitive biases. One is called not invented here. And that's a kind of, you know, um, I would say uh, restriction or, or um, un unwillingness of organizations or teams to use something what hasn't been invented in their teams. And we have the opposite of it, which is called invented here by us. So it means like if it's our invention, okay, we may not have invented the Kanban search, but we uh, we build it all together and it's our Kanban for our system. It's, it's tailored, it's customized for our system. Uh, we feel like this is something what is actually coming from here. Okay, let's move along. Uh, we're going to talk about a uh, very dangerous thing and we're going to talk about story points. I told you we're going to talk about story points. I'm going to basically curse the story points, but I'm going to uh, I'm going to cherish the planning poker. So, so let's uh, let's talk about it. So, uh, what we see in here is a boat and a, and a rope and an anchor. So you probably heard about the uh, anchoring effect. Uh, that's another interesting co uh, cognitive bias. So, um if any of you ever, um, if any of you ever uh, seen any kind of discussion when we say, you know, okay, I, I'll give you a life example today. I had a Kanban class today earlier before this meetup, and I asked in the very morning at what time we should have the lunch break. So it was very easy uh, because one person said, let's have it at 2 p.m. Yeah? What just happened is like he anchored them around the value. Yeah? Of course, no one would probably propose a lunch break at 11 or very late at four, uh, but the first number that we heard, the first value that we were exposed basically anchored the whole team. And this very often happens when we do uh, some kind of uh, exercise with uh, setting the, the whip limits. So we say, we, we even do a kind of simulation, like probably, you know, feature ban or, or flow lab or, or tweak or any kind of, you know, Kanban simulation games. Uh, and there's this, there's this moment when you as a, as a facilitator or, or a coach or maybe a team member come and say, okay, let's, let's introduce the whip limits. Yeah? Just like the very first uh, uh, question we asked today. And then someone says, yeah, it's super easy. Uh, it's five people. So it should be 15 tasks for the team. Let's have 15. Okay, we are doomed yeah? because uh, we, we know that, uh, that it's probably not a good idea. We know that they will learn how to fail, but we also know um, that they've been just anchored by, by this person. And it's even worse if it's kind of alpha dev who says, you know, that's what I think it should be. Yeah? Even if they have different ideas, I don't know if you see it on the picture, they had some cards like the planning poker cards with fours and six. They, they, if, if they are not really, I would say, assertive, they are not going to um, propose values which are very much different from, uh, from the first person set. And I would say that's a very dangerous uh, uh, step because, uh, well, it may really slow down any kind of initiative on, if, of introducing the work in progress limits because these people will have a feeling like they introduced it, they're going to introduce it very high. And of course, they're going to say it didn't work. Yeah. You, you told us to limit work in progress. We selected our value and it didn't work. So how could we prevent it from happening? Uh, another big piece of, uh, or, of really mind-twisting literature is the newest book by Daniel Kahneman, but also Oliver Siboney and uh, Cass Sunstein, that the same person from, uh, who was the co-author of The Nudge, um, is the noise. Yeah, I need to say that I started uh, listening to this book as an audiobook and I had to stop several times because it's so heavy, but it's really great because it exposes us to things that we can actually learn from the planning poker people. So why do planning poker looks like it does is that basically, um, well, uh, we are supposed to uh, uh, talk about an item 
and talk about its complexity, about its innovative as innovation aspect, about its uh, probably effort behind it, etc. Maybe risk related to delivering it, uh, but we shouldn't uh, say it loud. Uh, we should have these kind of cards or today very often applications, and uh, we we should keep it for ourselves. And then on one, two, three, just raise the hand, ra raise the cards, or raise the hands with fingers, right? Um, and this is actually what we can do uh, today when we want to talk about such things. So if we are about to, um, let's just say, propose or open the team uh, for a discussion uh, regarding setting up the WIP limit, uh, we should rather come with, uh, well, um, a similar technique. So, you know, just ask everyone in the team. It's okay to say, I don't know, but let's ask everyone in the team what kind of value do you think we should have? And I and I guarantee you that we're going to have a wider um, wider range of proposals, and we're going to have three and fours and eight and fifteens. And uh, thanks to to having, I would say, more um, more variable input uh, from the people, uh, we may have actually um, good discussion because we can talk about okay, so what do we expect to happen if we choose eight uh, over fifteen? Um, how to do it remotely? This is what I just did with you in the very beginning of this uh, of this workshop. Yeah, so I ask you to write the, the the cognitive biases names, and many of you said confirmation bias, and I I it's only my bet. I put my money on this bet that if I wouldn't put the um, the private mode, and some of you who in the end wrote the confirmation bias. Probably once you saw the confirmation bias, you wouldn't uh, repeat this message, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and 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 probably um, many of you would um, uh, would uh, think about confirmation bias as a thing to write. But some of you uh, wrote the post-it with some other names of confirmation bias because, well, you were I don't want to say forced, but you were encouraged to look in, inside your brains. For the examples of other um, other examples. Okay, let's move along. Now we have a man who's walking on a tightrope, and uh, well, he's a senior developer. Uh, why do we think he's good at it? Well, because he's a senior. <laughs> what we're talking about is, of course, the halo effect, and and that was uh, one of the cognitive biases that you listed, right? So we say, well, he's a senior dev. I trust him. He surely knows what he's doing. Well, of course, that's a foolish example because no one says that if you're a senior developer, then you're good in everything or at everything, like, like walking the line. Mm, but come on, if we look at it, uh, we very often uh, talk to people who are senior in their domain, either analysis or design or graphics or development. And we ask them about, for example, nature of their work, about the lead time distribution or such things. And uh, we see that many people... Uh, see those people in the organization as experts also in the areas which are, uh, well, I would say far away from their true expertise. I said, we're going to have some political examples. So some of you said like, you know, uh, we expect good looking people to be, uh, <laughs> to be smart uh, or, or something like this. Come on, this is what happens in any kind of uh, political campaign. I'm not going to talk about politics. I'm just talking about, you know, um, what uh, what happens um, uh, what happens with um, uh, with any kind of uh, you know people who are promoted to become a president or a prime minister or whoever else, right? We have this behavior like he's so good looking that he will going to be a great leader. And of course, we have I would say sorry. Now I'll be openly uh, <laughs> criticizing. Come on, if she has 10 million followers on Instagram, she surely knows what she's talking about, the climate change, yeah? Come on, yeah, that's that's a typical halo effect. The fact that you are a good gamer, the fact that you are a great artist, the fact that you are maybe a great scientist, it doesn't basically uh, give you a mandate or it doesn't make you an expert in the other domain. Uh, but unfortunately, this happens in our professional work environments, and uh, that's not uh, that's not easy, I would say, to to prevent from. Um, and uh, we also have the same situation, I would say, um, uh, leveled up. Let's put it this way: to to the to, to level of the teams. So we see that you know, if one team is doing something, the other teams and organizations are doing the same. For example. 
they do story points estimations. And I want to say openly, I have nothing against planning poker because I believe just like uh, the example of, you know, asking the team for differences in their opinion, especially um, uh, if we do it in an anonymized way uh, or not anchoring way is a great thing. But of course, we know that story points will get translated into mandates and euros and whatever else, right? Um, and we ask if we ask people why do they do it, it's like, ah, well, we don't really know what to do with it, but we just heard that it's good. And uh, we, 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 uh, we see that all other teams in our organizations are doing the same. How we call it? We call it a bandwagon effect. So we basically uh, don't want to do something we, uh, different, uh, so, like socially or, or, or uh, team-wise. Um, we want to basically be um, very consistent with behavior of our colleagues uh, from our team or from our organizations. That's, of course, very dangerous because uh, it kills, uh, I would say, multiple uh, spaces for innovation. Um, or, or basically uh, exposing that some of our practices do not have any logical, um, I would say, uh, reasoning. Um, those of you who are familiar with Kanban examples, we know that in this evolutionary change management uh, model, we very often say that we have something what is called revolutionary relics, right? So things which are uh, basically uh, very, I would say, um, what, how, how to describe it, like, you know, they exist for no clear reason, right? They bring no clear value now, but we, we do it because, well, we do it like this forever since, uh, uh, since ages, and it's even stronger where other teams or other people in our organization, organization do it. So I'm closely moving to, to an end, but I'm going to talk about the heaviest topic now. So... Um, if someone has an opinion, the data may, may be actually the worst argument to, to talk to them. Um, so I very often hear, okay, let's, let's introduce work in progress limit and let's bring them some data. Hmm. There is a problem uh, that there are people, like here I took a, a tweet from, uh, I would say quite well-known guy who's like popularizing science, who says like the good thing about science is that it's true where, uh, where you, whatever, whether you be, believe in it or not, yeah? Uh, I also found a quote from my personally uh, favorite writer ever, Philip K. Dick, who said reality uh, is uh, which when you stop believing it, it doesn't go away. Uh, but in a discourse of all these conversations about climate change or vaccination or politics or <laughs> whip limits, um, we know that unfortunately, if someone's opinion is not based on science, probably science is not going to—it's not going to change it. Yeah. So, uh, so this is a big, uh, big, big issue that you know uh, we try to argue using the wrong type of arguments. If we have emotional, if we have beliefs-based uh, uh, position or point of view, um, exposing people to hard data is is only going to polarize it. Um, but is there a point to expose people uh, to exposing people to data? Well, it's it's not totally lost uh, uh, chances. Um, we very often come to organization and ask people, you know, how long does it take to deliver X, be it a story, a feature, or, or a bug fix, or whatever. And some people say, well, let's just say it takes two months. Uh, what, what can happen here is that they may be actually right. So if we look at the, you know, uh, scatter plot of the lead times, we're going to find that one of the last examples of the lead times is two months. Uh, the, the, the trap in here is that uh, we very often fall into the trap of so-called recency effect. Uh, so we remember very well the values which are basically describing the, uh, the very um, near past. Yeah? So uh, if we look at the same example um, uh, with the wider um, scope, wider range, and we look at the details, we see like, okay, the last dot was two months, uh, but uh, in the past, you had many multiple way, uh, multiple examples of um, uh, of longer lead times, but also shorter lead times, and that's not what you uh, remember. Uh, unfortunately, what what kicks in here is another is another cognitive bias, which is co called anecdotal fallacy. Uh, so we're gonna find one great example of a thing, for example, the shortest lead time uh, noted ever. 
And uh, because it was so much different from the other examples, we're going to remember about it. And we may uh, basically refer to it uh, to build any kind of predictions or forecast in, in the future. Unfortunately, if the lead time distribution looks like here, we know that basing uh, basic on this, this example uh, is not, it's, it's not the great thing to do. Um, we said that if one's opinion is based on, on beliefs or, or yeah, opinions, not data, uh, it, it's hard to, you know, take these people away. And, uh, and, and of course, the worst thing that we can do is saying like, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. Yeah, of course, it's going to raise the resistance. If they're going to feel uh, attacked, they're going to feel um, that it's, uh, it's, not, um, it's not respectful for them. Um, so it also depends how do we actually ask, uh, how, how do we actually uh, expose people to this, to this data? So uh, we, could, uh, we could ask, uh, for example, how often something happens and uh, what they're going to tell us is like, oh, you know, we cannot really predict any lead time because we are so unique, we are so special. Uh, every type of, uh, every piece of code that we write, every feature is so much different that we cannot really say. Well, of course you can, you know, hook up the Jira to, to NAVE like I did here if with one team and we see that it's not like it's totally random. So we have some distribution, which is not even surprising for us Kanban people. Um, and uh, why we hear such opinions different from the data is that we have uh, two more um, cognitive biases. One is the neglect of the probability that our brains come on, they are not wired to think statistically. And the second thing, uh, it's not official name of the cognitive bias, but we call it a random mania. Yeah? So we believe like, you know, events are random, even if there are patterns, which basically allow us to, um, to build some kind of, uh, let's just say forecasts, um, more precise than just saying, oh, it's gonna take one from one to 74 days. Uh, like the example of, of this graph. Um, but uh, how could we change it? How could we say, uh, how, how could we expose people uh, in, in different way than just showing them graph and saying, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. Well, we could look for something what is positive in it. And that's, that's not a fail. That's one of the successes that I had with one team um, is that uh, you, you pull this type of data, uh, but you don't uh, use this data to prove them uh, they are wrong, but uh, you use it to uh, basically show them something positive that they uh, were not aware of. Uh, so actually, if you do the analysis of this histogram, you're going to find that this team is pretty predictable. It's just like uh, the ranges of the lead times is, uh, are, are different and they are predictable with some uh, kind of... Um, tasks not having dependencies, and they are not totally random with the tasks having dependencies. If you're gonna, I would say, surprise people by the positive, uh, I would say, uh, e exposure to the data, uh, what we're gonna have is we're gonna have a framing effect. Yeah? So another, I would say, bias, a kind of influence that we get on the people, that we're gonna show them the, the, the same data, um, I would say, in the language of, of benefits, uh, not in the language of, uh, of criticizing. And um, one final thing I wanted to show you is that um, if we talk about exposing people to data, uh, to build is to understand, but to build is actually to increase the chances to, to understand, is uh, something what we call a modality effect. Uh, modality effect is, is basically uh, something that we can use every time we expose uh, the teams to do practices like flow reviews or service delivery reviews, or if you're a scrum person, you may do it uh, with, I don't know, retrospectives or sprint reviews. So basically engage people into the, 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 the process. Why? Because apparently it seems that, uh, I would say the fact how much we learn or how much we remember depends very much on how we are exposed to learning. Yeah, so if it's gonna be just lecture, like me now speaking to you for last 30 minutes or more, it's gonna be boring. So this is not what I recommend you to do with the teams. And uh, yes, you could basically take away the fun from the team and say, well, use the Jira Flow Companion for uh, Google Chrome and you're gonna have the, the metrics available. Uh, but what you can do instead is, again, you can use a mural or mirror or any kind of, uh, you know, digital whiteboard and you can 
basically ask people to build these metrics with you, because if they're going to build it with you, again, we're going to have the IPI effect, so it's going to be theirs, uh, but they will remember it much, much more vivid. So what I do with the teams is I basically uh, try to engage them into building uh, these kind of histograms for the items that they deliver within the last period and, uh, and build it by themselves uh, by just, you know, uh, moving the, the digital post-its uh, which stand behind some Jira tickets and uh, in the end, uh, discussing about the long tail, uh, discussing about the reasons uh, behind it, and they need to do their own investigation. They need to check the transitions. They need to check the comments in Jira. They need to check the, um, the, the reasons why it was so much longer than some other examples. Um, of course, uh, some people may be, I would say, against such practices uh, openly, and, and it's not going to be easy, but uh, well, come on. Uh, we can always re refer to like, well, do you find the, 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 the existing meetings, uh, I would say, engaging or rather boring? And uh, we can propose them as a kind of experiment. So like if they are going to definitely not need it, let's not be uh, stubborn. Uh, let's uh, rather be uh, like the water, my friend. That's the kind of I'm saying. So let's try to avoid the, the resistance. But um, I would say I, I, I've, I've seen as a coach or a trainer, multiple uh, examples of uh, being, even for me, more, su more successful, surprisingly more successful than, than I predicted. Okay, I'm, I'm wrapping it up slowly. So, um, well, answering the, the, the ultimate question, I, I don't think that the cognitive biases are, are um, neither friends nor foes. It's, it's just like they are there we are influenced by them. Uh, all the people are influenced by them. Uh, they are here for, for millennia. They are here much longer than COVID mass. They are going to stay with us much longer than remote work. And um, I believe that if we spend some time, in, if we invest some time into, um, well, learning about them, learning about the mechanisms that, uh, that influence our behavior and, and people's behavior, we can use them, uh, we can use some of them in, in our favor. And uh, as I see in the chat, uh, I think someone already shared it. Uh, what I recommend, if you're not familiar with it, there is the, I'm, I'm gonna share it also with this presentation like links, um, but you can Google for it. There's the Cognitive Bias Codex. That's uh, amazing interactive uh, map uh, where you can find uh, over 180, if I'm not mistaken, cognitive biases. Not all of them are applicable to our, our work. Uh, some of them are applicable to our professional lives, but some are to our personal lives. Uh, I, I recommend it because it's, it's, it's really a huge, interesting, um, I would say, field, uh, field of knowledge. Um, okay, and that's it from me. So if you have any questions or comments, if you strongly agree, disagree with anything, I'm happy to hear um, your, your comments.